you have a prepaid call from an inmate at the Kern Valley State Prison, Delano, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using... Hey, how you doing, brother? Hey, all right. How about yourself? Oh, I'm doing great since you called now. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, what's your nationality? Uh, I'm, I'm white and Indian. And I was born in uh, Los Angeles, California in uh, 1968. Okay, so that's where you're from, uh, um, out in the streets? Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm uh, from Washington State, uh, Kitsap County. Uh, uh, in a little small town called Silverdale, that's where I would grew up at. But I moved to California and met my dad for the first time when I was 15. And since, you know, as soon as I felt that hot sun on my skin, I'm like, oh man, I gotta get away from all this coldness and enjoy the sun. Fun in the sun, as they say. So that's oh. where I started my... Go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, that's where, you know, where I started all my you know, fun funs right there in California at the beaches. Enjoyed the, the weather a lot. And I stayed there ever since I got there. You know, and I went back a couple times to Washington, but then mostly I just stayed there once I got there when I was 15. Okay, were you ever part of any gangs, groups, prison gangs, or organizations? Well, you know, on the streets I had like a, a group of uh, four people there that I kicked it with and associated with and did illegal activities with. And then when I went to prison, um, I got associated with the, with the AB as an associate. And I just met them through just regular old prison stuff, doing regular prison stuff any white man has to do. And then when I got up to the Bay, I met all the big homies up there. And then continued my shenanigans, I guess you could say. Okay, what, what, did they call, what did they call you within that organization? Um, well, when I was in Chino, I just went by Rooster in reception, and then this guy named Rooster got stabbed, so I had to uh, you know, put a new moniker because I didn't want to get mixed up with somebody else named Rooster, so I put Blue in front of the name Rooster, so I, I'm called Blue Rooster. I'm the only one in the state of California that has that name. There's other roosters, but I'm the only blue one. Blue because it's my favorite color. Okay, what are you incarcerated for, and how long is your sentence? Um, I got incarcerated uh, back in 1989 for uh, for robbery. Um, I robbed a homosexual, and then in um, 91 I robbed um, somebody at an ATM, and then in uh, 1994, um, I got arrested for an ex-felon with a firearm, and they gave me 25 life for that. And how long have you been incarcerated? Um, since then. Uh, it's about 28 years, I guess. Yeah, right around there. Okay, I noticed that, you know, from previous conversations, you told me that, um, that you were in um, Gangland, National Geographic, I believe the Pelican Bay one in um, 2016. Can you elaborate on that experience and um, you know what you were doing in that show? Yeah, uh, well, I was going through the, to the debriefing process because um, I thought that you know it would change my life, I'd do something different with it because the road I was traveling was just I couldn't handle it anymore. So, um, this National Geographic came by and asked me if I wanted to do a, like a, a little interview where they come and they film me inside my cell, like uh, doing exercises and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, why not? And so I did it in C12. Um, it's, uh, that's where they used to send the people that were locking up uh, to C12 and they came, they, they viewed this. And, and I don't think I was actually part of a bunch of questions or anything because I've never seen it. But from what I understand is they have me in there, like, walking around the cell or something, or because I got a picture on my tablet about, you know, me being in the cell right there. So 
the biggest, I can't remember the exact interview, but I'm in there, so I don't know exactly what all they said that I can remember. Mm -hmm. I think it is mostly me exercising and stuff like that. And I think uh, they asked me about fishing, like how we get our kites from one person to another. Right. I, I, I seen that. I actually viewed it yesterday. And um, for the audience that wants to view it, the gentleman um, is on Daily Motion. Matter of fact, www.dailymotion.com. I'm going to put a link of description in the bottom for anyone that wants to see this gentleman on the show, um, on the Gangland um, documentary, um, National Geographic. And also, um, he's pretty much at the 15-minute mark around that time frame and you can see the gentleman on there um first and foremost are you going through any appeal still or you ha are you exhausted already yeah i'm exhausted by appeal but there's things going on in the course with these new laws changing and um i fit some of the criteria like the elderly parole stuff and uh, also the non-violent uh, laws have been in the place so i'm in the process of going through the courts and all that right now. That's a slow process because they always, especially where I'm at here at Kern Valley, they always kind of buck you on legal stuff and they always make things hard for you to do. But persistence, slow and steady as they say. But I have action. I have a chance to get out someday. Hopefully within the next two, three, four years or so. Okay, I hear you, brother. With that being said, um, the next question I have for you, without any self-incrimination, um, since since you stated all that, um, would you able to elaborate in your own words the events that occurred that landed you in prison? Um, I would have to say the root of it would be alcohol, drinking, and uh, making stupid decisions. And um, what made me go to um, my, like my second term when I went to prison on my second term, I. Uh, I found a good influence, and I learned to trade and everything, and I said, you know, I don't want to be in prison anymore, this ain't for me, you know, I'm a young man, I should be using my head, not, you know, being stupid, and using drugs and alcohol, and uh, so I got, you know, qualified in uh, welding and certified, and then when I got out, I was only out of prison uh, 34 days, and I armed myself, because uh, that's just what I used to do, and I got caught with the gun, and then they gave me 25 life for it. Well, I actually slipped. You know what I mean? Just that little slip, you know, it cost me the rest of my life. You know, that's the worst thing you can do to somebody pretty much is just lock them up, you know, for nothing, basically. That's how I feel about it. You know, I lost my right to bear arms, so they're like, all right, Alan, you're out of here. You we, we think you're a killer or whatever, but, you know, take your life. So it kind of wigged me out. And uh, when I went to prison, I had a real bad attitude because I felt that. I was unjustly um, judged, and so I just went on a mean one and just started hurting everybody around me. And then I landed in Pelican Bay with an 18-year shoot term due to all my violence and stuff. It kind of wrecked my life. But the root of it all was alcohol, low self-esteem from the way I was raised as a kid, and um, just made those stupid decisions. I didn't know how to talk to people or talk to people about my feelings and, you know, and seek any kind of help from anybody. I just drank, drank, and I took away all my pain, and I shouldn't have done that. But they say hindsight's twenty twenty, right? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Um, I stabbed a correctional sergeant there at Sentinella, and um, they sent me to, that's one of the things, the reasons why I went to the shoe. Okay, you mentioned that you were um, Aaron Brotherhood, so my next question for you is, brother, um, I know that the Aaron Brotherhood select um, elite individuals and individuals that are really violent and also um, that is pretty much down with their calls and, you, you know, and they're, you know, I mean, you have to put them that organization first than anything else so my question to you is how did you manage to get in the Aaron Brotherhood um, well I was actually never um, indicted or put up to be a brother um, I was just you know an associate just, uh, just a regular old person um, doing what's expected of them 
But as far as like actually being a member, I was never a member. Just, just an associate. I just basically did a bunch of dirty work. You know, I always had my hand raised to hurt people because, you know, I didn't care. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Um, and doing what's expected of me from the higher ups, you know, um, but. You have 60 seconds remaining. But the prison has me down as an AB dropout. That's how they have me marked down at And how did they have you down with an AB dropout? I guess, I guess from their their uh, paperwork, whatever they generate, you know, the game squads and all them people, whatever they do to determine, you know, um, who's doing what's what. Okay, do you know um, how the AB first started? Do you have any knowledge of that? Oh yeah, the Bluebirds, back in the day, yeah. Yeah, they, they were started to, to uh, preserve the white man in prison. That's why they were formed, to keep the other races from trying to victimize us. Okay, do you know like how the AB eventually split? Because I know there's a split um, with the state and the feds and also um, maybe isn't the federal faction is not even recognizing the state faction. Do you, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, um, the AB in, in, in the state of California is more race-based, more um, race-oriented, like gangs, stuff like that. Um, the feds are more about money. You know, the federal, they're more about making money and things like that. You know? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You know, since it's so-called the end of hostilities, do the white crips or white bloods, are they allowed to walk the main line without any repercussions? Yeah, no. No, they were moved upon immediately. Yeah, no, they couldn't walk. No main line. No, they eventually got, unless, you know, they... Um, hit like a level three or something like that, but as far as level fours, they got usually a race riot would start over it if they backed them. But most of the time, they got they got booted off the yard pretty quick. What eventually um, made you step out of being an associate of the AB? Um, the fact that it was all fake, you know, the, the way you know. The big homies, they, they sit there and they, they tell you, oh, yeah, you know, you do this, you do that, blah, blah, blah. And the first time you make a little mistake, they try to get you killed. You know, and then they want you to move on people that you like. And there's just, to me, it was just a bunch of fake stuff, you know. And not only that, I was filled with so much anger and hate that fueled all my violence in prison that I had to, I had to step back from it, knowing that I was going to be a target put on me for it. But I figured I had to change become somebody different, you know, somebody that didn't live to hurt others. That's all I did. I mean, just every time I turn around, I'm doing something stupid. So uh, I just started changing my life and trying to become a better person, you know, and try to uh, be a, a better influence for people around me that want to change and do better in their life. And so that's kind of... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And the only way I can do that by stepping back from them. Because that's the only way that the uh, California Department of Corrections would recognize me because they were real scared of me. And uh, the only way they, they, you know, would let me uh, get away from all this is I had to do what they call debriefing. That's where they just, like, tell me everything I've done and why I did it and stuff like that. So um, that was the first step. And it was the biggest one I ever made in my life. And uh, But from that time on, I've done nothing but grow and become a better person once I got away from all that shenanigans and stuff in prison, you know? Okay, what do you have to say to the youngsters, the youth out here that's involved in gang activity or thinking about joining gangs, brother? Um, what I have to say is, you know, it's not what you think it is. I mean, people will use you up. You know, they'll, they'll have you go on runs and do things where you don't profit. The only thing you get if somebody else standing next to you said, hey, good job, brother. Hey, right on, you're my buddy. Hey, good job, right? And then meanwhile, what you're doing is you're just 
you're ruining your life. You're throwing it all away for the love and companionship of a friend, which you know, I can understand, right? But you need to be your own captain to your own ship, and you need to make better decisions because if you come here to prison, it's going to be nothing but bad for you because the bottom line is it's either death or you're going to get hurt or you're going to just turn into somebody that you don't want to turn into. Because, you know, prison is its own beast in itself. And it changes people. It, changes, it even changes good people. It turns them bad. That's the nature of prison. So I would say, you know, if you, if, you know, you're having problems, you know, maybe with family, you know, seek some counseling. You know, go to job court. You know, if, if you believe in God, go talk to a counselor. You know what I mean? Talk about your problems. Don't feel free to tell people that you have a problem or you're experiencing problems in your life like I did, because I didn't talk to nobody. Don't talk to them because there's people out there that want to help you. And don't get, don't be doing dope, don't be doing alcohol, because that's just going to make you do stupid shit. You're know, going to make stupid decisions under the influence like I did. You don't want to do that. You know, then, you know, you're going to be like me. All that I did is I lost my right to bear arms, and they gave me 25 years of life to that. That's just a little slip, but that's the system for you. So, yeah, just think, you know, just try to think about yourself first instead of the gang you want to join, you know, because you think that you're cool or you want to be cool or accepted by others. That's, a, you know, another reason a lot of people join up is because they want to feel accepted and cared for and loved, you know, because they're not getting that from home or from your other friends. And that's a wrong thing to do. But see, when you're young, you're very influenceable by others. People that are older will manipulate you because of your age. The next thing you know, you're going to land right here. This ain't a place because your family's going to miss you, you know, and, and you're not going to have a chance to have kids. You know what I mean? Because you're too busy being in prison, not being around, you know, around somebody that loves and cares for you or wants to make a family with you. You know, you blow all that out the door when you make those kind of decisions. Because there's no future in prison. The future is out there on the streets, being next to people who care about you and love you. And it's your job as an individual to take care of yourself before anybody else, before a gang or anything. You come first. Because you're a unique individual and you have a lot to offer in this world. You just don't know what it is yet because you're young. But when you get older, you'll figure that shit out. And you'll see that, okay, I, I'm glad I didn't do those drugs. I'm glad I didn't go down that road. And by me telling you this, sharing this with me makes me feel better because I didn't have anybody telling me that when I was growing up or offering me this kind of advice. Like when you come to prison, right, um, automatically you have expectations that are placed upon you just because of the color of your skin. And no matter what, you have to listen to what other people tell you. Because if you don't, you're going to get hurt. You know, and nobody wants that, right? So just remember that prison isn't all what it what it is signed up to be. Um, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So um, when I was... Uh, a young kid, right? I, uh, I come from a family that's pretty dysfunctional. I got screamed at and yelled at a lot. And my uh, stepbrother he used to uh, jump on me and, and uh, beat me up. And so I started acting out. And then uh, my stepfather called my mom into signing me over to the state um, at age seven. And I was put in this place called Tom Study Treatment Center for kids uh, at seven years old, and I spent a year here, and then uh, they put me on women. And so every time I went, my family moved from Tacoma to Bremerton, Washington. And then from there, everything was fine for about a year, and then the um, abuse started again with uh, a lot of mental abuse and a lot of verbal abuse. And um, by the time I was 12, uh, my parents uh, went to a group home, they sent me to a group home. And um, I spent a year there, and then when I got back, um, I got into trouble. My parents decided to kick me out, and so I was onto the streets at age like 13 and a half. And from there, uh, I had to learn how to um, 
fit for my show. And then a hooker helped me out. And then from there, I, I started stealing and uh, doing robberies, stealing from the Johns and stuff. And um, I started drinking a lot to ease the pain. So I always felt I was alone in the world, that nobody loved me, especially, you know, my parents. And I didn't really have no siblings at that time that I really cared about. I do now, but, but back then I did it. And so um, I started doing a lot of drinking, and um, I tried to go to the job corps, but I got kicked out. And that was my thing. I really tried to turn my life over there. But I was selling weed and doing this and that, and the bottom line is they kicked me out. And then from there, I went to uh, California, and that's where I met my real dad for the first time. And I continued uh, my illegal ways, and um, but I was sent to prison. And I explained earlier what I went to prison for. But uh, when I got to prison, um, prison really wasn't prison like how I feel now, because I only got three years, and so it was like a place where, oh, all right, I met the homies, they're cool, all right. I kind of looked up to a couple people because they were bikers, and, and uh, they had a lot of power over other people, so I kind of looked up to them, like real bad influences. And then my second term, uh, I decided oh, I got to do something good with my life. I can't, you know, this ain't cool. This ain't a place for me. But, like I said, I slipped up and I got caught with a gun. You know, they gave me 25 years to life for that. You know, um, I just didn't know what to do right there. Because, you know, to me, that's like, what's the worst thing you can do to somebody to take their life? The second thing you can the worst thing to do, this piece of my foot, or to imprison them for 25 years to life. That's like taking somebody's life. Because back then, in the early 80s, California wasn't, uh, let nobody out with a 25 life sentence or a 15 life sentence. So basically it's a death sentence for me. So I went down and um, I started hurting everybody else around me. And I did that for like 15 years and I accumulated a 20 year shoot program, a shoot term. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And then uh, one day, right, I noticed that I was so tired of hurting people and I couldn't live with myself anymore. You know, I contemplated suicide, but I could never do it because that's just, you know, not me, but I still had those feelings. And so I decided, you know, I need to change. You know, and the first thing I need to do is stop my violence. You know, and I always hurt people offensively because that's just what you do in prison. You always attack first. You never let somebody uh, attack you first because you're going to come up short every time. So I stopped that. I started changing my life. And um, so what I want to say to the kids out there, right, is that if, if, you, if you can relate to what I just said to you that's happening to you, right, try to join the service or something. Instead of joining a gang, join the service. You know what I mean? That America needs you more than some gang members need you. You know what I mean? You're just going to kill other people's kids. At least if you want to, you know, be bad and be tough, do it for the right reasons. You know, not for the wrong ones. You know, and join the service, you know, and if you can't get into the service, um, try a job corps. You know, they're always willing to accept people, you know what I mean, especially people that have low-income families. You know, go and do that. And um, if you need someone to talk to, donate your time to, like, the Humane Society or something, or go to the church, your local church, and donate your time, and you'll be surprised the people that you meet. And um, maybe they can help you with, it, with whatever you're struggling with. So... I just wanted to let you guys know that, too. And the last thing I want to say is that if, if you go to prison, right, and you think that you're going to be a tough guy, well, there's going to be dudes in prison that, like, kill people, like, and do real heinous shit to people. And uh, when they look at you, they're going to just look at you just like nothing. Like, your life has no meaning or nothing. They'll try to stuff you out. You know what I mean? And you don't want to live your life always having to look behind your back. You know, that's, that's like PSD times four. You know what I mean? And so just, you know, think about your life. Because remember, like I said earlier to you guys, you're the captain of your own ship. You have more meaning than you're aware of now. Your life means a lot to certain people. You just don't know who it is yet. You know, so don't go be looking, going to gangs for friendship and comfort and brotherhood and all that. No, it's all bad right there. So that's what I got to say to you guys, and if anybody wants to ever write me or whatever, or if there's something on your mind and you need somebody to listen to you, then give me a, give me a shout out, man. You know, you can get me on jpay.com um, or whatever, and you can get on my tablet. They allow us to uh, talk to people on tablets, you know. I, I got no problem spending time with you and talking, you know, if you feel like sharing or whatever. 
I'm open to that, especially if I can be a good influence. Okay, I don't have any other questions for you, but do you have anything else to address and add? Um, no, no, that's pretty much it. Um, this whole world, you know, I hope uh, if things going good for everybody out there, and try to be nice to the next guy next to you, you know, try to make somebody smile. You know what I mean? Somebody who got two feet next to you, you know, turn around and say, hey, how you doing? Be nice to somebody. Make them smile. You have 60 seconds remaining. Do you have any family or friends out here that you want to maybe give a shout out to? Oh yeah, I got uh, my sister Shelly, and uh, she's like, I just she just came into my life about a year and a half ago. I just found out, um, and she we've always been separated, but now we're we're together again, and um, I love her to death. She's like. The reason why I try to behave and be good now is for her and my family and my nieces and uh, my my brother-in-law, Sean, and my friend, Julie, uh, who lives in Australia, and um, my friend, Stacy, who lives in Olympia, Washington. But that's my family right there. Those are my only friends that I have and my family members.